Okay, so tonight, Be'ezras Hashem, we're going to be continuing with our serum on the concept of Shabbos, on the world of Shabbos. And tonight's shir is going to be on the day of Shabbos itself, Sudas Hayom Shel Shabbos. Now, the first three shirim that we had were on the world of Erev Shabbos, that time of the past, before the emergence of Shabbos. After our shirim on the day of Shabbos itself, there are going to be shirim on Motzei Shabbos, the future, which is the anticipation of what happens when Shabbos ends. And like we spoke about so often, we cannot have access to the present moment of Shabbos without the bookends of the past and the future allowing for the shape of the present to manifest itself. But like everything, it needs to be broken up into three parts because everything is comprised of a beginning, a middle, and an end, a top, a middle, and a bottom, a past, a present, and a future. So even when it comes to Erev Shabbos, we have to speak about it in three ways. When it comes to Motzei Shabbos, we have to speak about it in three ways because whatever is in the klal, whatever is in the general breakdown of that triadic structure is also going to be found within the prat, within the particular so that when you magnify and zoom in on each building block of the general structure, each and every one of those triadic parts is going to contain three elements within itself as well. And what we've been talking about so far with regards to the day of Shabbos is we spoke about the night of Shabbos, Leil Shabbos. The time of the day of Shabbos, the morning of Shabbos itself is going to be unique within the structure of the present moment of Shabbos. Because Friday night, like we spoke about last week, is animated due to the fact that it is a movement away from Erev Shabbos. And that the Yitzia, the exit away from the struggle and the chaos and the confusion of Erev Shabbos is what gives us the true taste of the power of Leil Shabbos, where we're able to show that this world and all of its brokenness and all of its difficulties and all of its confusion is in truth loftier than the higher world, which is what we spoke about with regards to the ascendancy of the human being and all of their vicissitudes and their struggles and their real life experience above and beyond that angelic presence of standing still in spite of the fact that they may experience a light or a revelation of God that is higher than what we're capable of grasping. So talking about Friday night is still in the shadow of Erev Shabbos. What we're going to discuss next week is the time of the third meal, that time of Shalashudis, of Rava de Ravin, and that's already Shabbos in relationship to the impending departure of Shabbos. Shalashudis is the fight against time. It's the desire to sit quietly in the darkness, even though we know that the end of Shabbos is right outside banging on the doors, banging on our hearts, banging on our minds. But both of those bookends of the day of Shabbos, both Friday night and Shalashudis, are animated by what comes before them or what comes after them. Friday night is animated by Erev Shabbos, and Shalashudis is animated by Motzei Shabbos. When it comes to the morning of Shabbos itself, It's the only moment of the Shabbos experience that is freed from the past or the future. It stands on itself. It is not seen in the shadow of Erev Shabbos, nor is it seen in the light of Motzei Shabbos. It is an experience unto itself. It is Shabbos itself to the point that it is so blindingly present that it's almost impossible to speak about. Dr. Benji Epstein in his book, Living in the Presence, describes this very poignantly when he utilizes the teachings of the Maharal. And these are ideas that are expressed throughout Hasidus as well through their utilization of the Maharal, who's both the father of the Baal Shem Tov and the Vilna Gon, as Rav Kook pointed out. But the concept of the present moment, the concept of the ace, Rav Soloveitchik also points this out in a profoundly powerful footnote in The Lonely Man of Faith, that the present moment escapes our grasp because any moment that I try and pinpoint and claim that this is the present, that I am present in the present, by the time those words leave my mouth, the present has already melted into the past and now I'm found stuck within what was previously my future. 
so that the present is so transient and it's so ungraspable that even the attempt to define it, even the attempt to pin it down in the slightest of ways through our conscious mind or through our feeling and emotional heart leads us to the recognition that I can't ever lay claim to the present moment. It's only when I am masalik my moichen, it's only when I stop trying to codify it or contextualize it that I can actually experience the ever-present present moment. That's the nace of the morning of Shabbos. The nace of the morning of Shabbos is that it's oimed b'fnei atzmo. It's not held up by a past, nor is it held up by a future. It stands simply upon itself, which is why Chazal described Shabbos as a matana, as a gift. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells B'nai Yisrael, matana tova yeshli b'beis ginzi v'shabbos shemo. There is a gift that is hidden within the hidden resources of my storehouse, and that's the name of Shabbos. Chazal and our Meforshim and our Tzadikim already point out that there's a paradoxical impulse at the heart of this statement. On the one hand, it is a gift that is given to the Jewish people. On the other hand, it's still Bebeis Ginzi. It's still hidden in the recesses of my concealment, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So how could it be that on the one hand, Shabbos is offered as a gift, yet on the other hand, that gift is still hidden within the recesses of concealment of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? And the answer that our tzaddikim give, Rav Kluger speaks about this at length in his profound svarim on Yichud HaShabbos, is that the moment and the present nature of Shabbos itself is both a gift that is given over, but any time I try and lay hold of that gift, I am forced to recognize that it is still concealed in the base ginzo. It's still hidden in the hidden resources of a Kaddish Baruch Hu storehouse because it is a gift that is offered to me beyond my human capacity to receive it. So any time I try and contemplate the gift itself, I'm forced to realize that it is still concealed because I can never truly place my finger on the pinpoint of that moment of Shabbos itself, of Shabbos day, which stands in isolation as the present of the present, no longer constricted to the past nor the future. For this reason, for this reason, at least on a personal level, I need to admit before speaking about this topic, because it's going to animate everything I say about this topic, Shabbos day, the time of Shabbos day, is by far, for me, the most difficult element of Shabbos. It is the hardest one to feel. It is the hardest one to try and grab hold of. It is the hardest one to try and lay claim to. And it's the hardest one to actually try and find insight into. Now, the very fact that it is difficult to lay claim to this Shabbos experience on the morning of Shabbos or on the day of Shabbos, from the time of Shacharis and Musaf and the Suda of Asika Kadisha, like we're going to discuss, I don't believe that it is symptomatic of the inability of the Jewish soul to lay claim to that experience, but rather the very nature of the experience is one that evades our ability to truly feel it. So that the inability to feel Shabbos day in and of itself, the way that we feel Friday night or the way that we feel Shalashudis is not a kink in the machine of Shabbos, chas v'shalom, but rather it is a constitutive element of Shabbos itself that because the present moment in its sheer presentness, in its bareness, without the experience of the past or the anticipatory fear of the future to give it shape, leaves us struggling to actually lay claim to exactly what is taking place on Shabbos. And what that translates into on a human level, at least for me, Lefianias Daiti and my experience, is the feeling that on the one hand, Shabbos morning and Shabbos day itself is the moment in time that is most removed from the felt phenomenological investment or experience of Shabbos. And on a certain level, that means it's going to be the least enjoyable. But on the other hand, that non-feeling or that inability to actually gain access into Shabbos itself is 
a representation of the true nature of that moment on Shabbos. And like we said, in the name of our tzaddikim, it is that moment where we're forced to acknowledge that even though Shabbos is a gift that is given over by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it is a gift that is still concealed within the base ginzi. It is still hidden within the recesses of hiddenness and concealment. In order to try and describe how one tries to gain access to that which is not felt, and naturally, as human beings, what is not felt leaves a person struggling a bit. Because after that experience of Friday night, where a person sits, as a result of that almost constitutive traumatic passage from the craziness of Arab Shabbos into that silence of the world of Leil Shabbos, where we come to realize that our human situatedness is in fact our very elevated status, that experience is one of fire and flames of intensity and experience and yichud and engaging with the body and engaging with humanity as it is experienced in this world of exiting the house back into the field to reveal that elevated status of the Jewish soul. The, that's a poignant feeling. That's an intensity. There's an intensification of the self. And the same is true with Shalashudis. There's a longing and a desire to hold on to that which we cannot hold on to. In the face of transiency, there's a desire to grab hold of any taste or any shemets of the Shabbos experience. And because of that anxiety of the absence of Shabbos, we're forced to actually engage with our emotional experience. But Shabbos day itself, because it is it is no longer under the threat of that which came before or that which comes after, doesn't offer us that intensification of the self to throw ourselves into it. And it leaves us feeling like there's something missing. How could this be the Shabbos experience? And that becomes even more magnified when a person looks at the Svarim HaKadoshim and the writings of the Zohar HaKadosh and the writings of the Arizal and the writings of the Tamidim of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh and the Tamidim of the Vilnagon and the Rashash and all the Mikubalim. When discussing the nature of Shabbos, unanimously they all agree that the Suda of Shabbos itself, the Suda of Yom HaShabbos, is on a certain level the loftiest point of Shabbos. That Musaf on Shabbos and the Kedusha of Shabbos, whether it's Na'aritzcha or Kedusha's Keser, is the point of Yichud. That's when human beings enter into a plane that is completely inaccessible to us the rest of the week. And at that loftiest point, when the Yichud, when that unity in the supernal realms, as it is reflected in our spiritual constitution down here in our psychological liveness, is on the one hand the loftiest of experiences. Yet on the other hand, it's the one that is most unconscious, the one that is left unspoken and unfelt, leaving the individual to yearn after something that we assume should be here, but we can't quite grasp it. We can't quite lay claim to exactly what the experience of Shabbos is. When describing the nature of Shabbos itself, Chazal tell us that a person needs to look at themselves as if all of their work is done. And this is something we've spoken about in the past, the secret of ki'ilu, the secret of as if, teaches us the power of the Jewish and the holy imagination that sometimes the call or the requirement of the spirit is to not feel something, but rather to act as if we feel something. And when Shabbos arrives, there is a call in the name of Chazal that we have to act as if all of our work is done. And in the name of our tzaddikim, the Orachayim HaKadosh, and the Morinayim, we know that this doesn't simply apply to physical action. This doesn't simply apply to worldly, mundane matters and the anxiety of the outside, which assault us every moment of the week, that on Shabbos, when Shabbos comes, we have to act as if that's gone. But it even applies to inyane ruchnias. It even applies to spiritual activity. 
that when Shabbos comes, a person has to act as if where I am is where I need to be. And that hakol kan, that if I am here, everything is here, and that I can be here now. Because Chazal recognize how difficult it is to actually experience that, there's a hermeneutical principle referred to as ki'ilu, as if, which teaches us that even though we can't truly experience it, if we act as if we are experiencing it, or phrased in a different psychological language, if we choose to see that this is how it is, even though it is not apparent to us, somehow, some way through the mechanics of spirituality, which are unfathomable to the human mind, we gain access to the experience itself. That ki'ilu, acting as if, doesn't simply mean that we're pretending even though we can't truly experience it, but the secret of ki'ilu, of as if, means that by acting as if and by utilizing the imaginative capacity within the human mind, we actually gain access to the thing itself. That the pretending that we engage in, the imagining that we engage in, gives us access to the true experience that still remains inaccessible to us. So as a response to the difficulty of how could it be that on the one hand, the morning and the day of Shabbos is the loftiest of experiences of Shabbos, yet on the other hand, it is on a certain level the most difficult element of Shabbos to grasp. The answer that I would like to posit with regards to this difficulty is that even though we can't truly feel Shabbos, even though when the day of Shabbos comes, a person is more often than not questioning why I don't feel that intensity that I felt on Friday night, or why can't I feel the intensity that I typically feel by Shalashudas. Even though it is an experience of doubt and self-doubt and anxiety over our spiritual situatedness, nevertheless, that very inability to grab hold of it is what forces us into the true avoda, the true work of Shabbos, which is entering into that space of ki'ilu, of as if. That even though I don't feel like all of my work is done right now in this moment, I can act as if and I can make believe and I can choose to pretend that I truly feel that all of my work is done. And that is how we gain access into the experience of Shabbos day. By foregoing our emotional sense of Shabbos, by willing to overcome that brokenness over not feeling Shabbos the way we should feel Shabbos, and choosing nevertheless to act as if it is Shabbos, if that means pushing back anger for a moment, if that means having slightly more intention in the food that we eat, if it means trying to force ourselves into a space of pleasure of ta'anug, which is animating of the experience of Shabbos, whatever way that we pretend on Shabbos morning, that is the ikr avoida. The ikr avoida of Shabbos morning is the act of ki'ilu, is acting as if I feel that shleimus. The Zohar HaKadosh discusses Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's claim that in his lifetime, there was never a moment where he missed out on the three meals of Shabbos. And he goes on to describe the spiritual capacity, the spiritual framework of those meals, of those experiences on Shabbos. And Rebbe Lazar Bray, Rebbe Lazar, the son of Rebbe Akiva, asks him, he says, Abba, how do we align these meals? How should we refer to these meals? And the meal of Leil Shabbos, as we spoke about last week, is referred to as Sudasa de Chakal Tapuchin Kadishin, the meal of the holy orchard of apples, which means, according to the Arizal and according to the Meforshim, it is the time of Malchus. It is experiencing on a certain level that lowest part of human experience, which we transform into being the crowning jewel of human experience. The Shabbos meal in the morning is the Suda of Asika Kadisha, the ancient holy one or the holy ancient one, something that we'll come back to in a moment. 
And the Suda Shlishis of Rav de Ravin of the third meal is the Sudasa of Zer Anfin, of the small countenance, of a state that is representative of constricted emotions where a human being feels themselves, but they feel themselves in their human construct and confines. And what the Mephorshim point out immediately is that it's all out of order because the typical order of ascension from a lower level to a higher level is that we go from malchus, which is our experience of this worldliness in all of its grossness and its mundanity and its physicality, which would be representative of Friday night. Then in theory, the next level would be Zer Anfin, that small countenance where we emerge out of our groundedness in the world of Malchus, but we experience the emotionality of what it means to be a human being on the level of Zer Anfin. And then the final crowning level would be Asika Kadisha, the holy ancient one, which is that transcendent sense of HaKadosh Baruch Hu beyond the capacity of human rationality. That should be the typical order. It should go from lowest to the middle, then to the highest. But instead, what we find in the writings of the Arizal and the Meforshim all bring this up as a question because it's based on the Zohar, is that the order of Shabbos is out of order. That on Friday night, we experience Malchus. We experience that physical experience where we elevate and, well, we first subdue and then transform and elevate human experience. And then on Shabbos day, immediately we find ourselves in the space of Atika Kadisha. And only after Shabbos day, when we come to Shalashudis, do we find ourselves at what should have been the experience of Shabbos meal of Zer Anfin. The Meforshim all discuss this because the experience of Atika Kadisha, Dahi Sudasa Da Asika Kadisha, Atika Kadisha, or the world of Atik, means that it is a world removed from the human capacity of grasp. Atik is that level of ta'anug. It's that pure pleasure that one takes when they ascend in their innermost minds out of the confines of this world, out of the anxiety of this world, even out of the need to subdue or repress or suppress anxiety to a place where anxiety no longer even exists. That nekuda of atik, that nekuda of that which is removed is quite literally the loftiest level of the seder and the system of the worlds and the spheros and the partsufim that the Arizal discusses. And somehow, some way, we find ourselves experiencing that on Shabbos morning. Now, this is brought up in the writings of the Ramchal and Adir Bamarom, in the writings of Rav Menachem and the Lev Shklov, in Mayim Adirim. But what I want to read from right now is a metzia, it's a gift that a friend of mine in St. Louis who was a student of Rav Meir Tribbetz. Rav Meir Tribbetz is a tremendous Talmud Chacham, uh, on a certain level unique in certain aspects in his wisdom, who's also very much in love with the Leshem and the Emek HaMelech and the writings of the Arizal. But Rav Meir Tribbetz translated or really transcribed the series of Shirim that Rav Soloveitchik, the Rav, gave on my Seberatius. And I believe that five of these transcripted shirim were published in an article in Chakira. And the sixth shir was not yet published, but a good friend of mine who is a Talmud of his gave me access to this. I remember having read it on a Shabbos afternoon at his house. And Rav Soloveitchik addresses this very question. Rav Soloveitchik in the transcription of the shirim that he gave at Bernard Revel Graduate School in the late 1940s says as follows. Let us analyze the three meals. What happens on Leil Shabbos on the night of Shabbos? The world of the night of Shabbos is lonely in a state of expectancy. The Shechina arises from the depths of thinghood to an upward path endowed with grace and friendliness. Haunted by loneliness and frightened by the muteness of mechanis mechanistic existence to the bright light of the personalistic existence. The meal expresses the feeling of a community of existence. 
the Shekhinah takes the upward path towards the merger and we join in. The day belongs to Malka Kadisha, not to the Shekhinah, to Malka Kadisha, belonging to the Deus persona, to that personal experience of godliness. While in the weekdays there is passivity to muteness, on Shabbos there is a revolt. Then the personal God descends from the infinite recesses to meet the Shekhinah or himself. This is the experience of Zer Anpin. As we know, what the Rav is describing here is very literally what we say, that our entire purpose is to unify the world of the Shekhinah, the world of Malchus, and the world of Kudshabrihu, of Zer Anpin. This is Zer Anpin, the little face, which is the third meal. And the Rav continues, but it should have been the second, but it was placed third because they never meet. It is in the twilight of the day which is done. The last meal is a joy and of parting because it is never realized, but is only a dream in the distant future. Then there is eternal vigilance for the next encounter during the next week, and so the cycle goes on. The Shabbos morning meal is symbolic of self-awareness and self-consciousness. The world is experiencing its selfhood and trying to experience God himself. This Suda is related to the great end, that Nukuda of Asika Kadisha, and it is placed in the middle to show that the great end is never reached, splitting it by standing in the second place, which is the meeting of the eschatological realization described above. Or of Soloveitchik is describing in a profound nature is that the reason the meal on the day of Shabbos is out of order and it represents the loftiest heights that a human being can experience is because it is coming to remind us that we can never truly feel that experience in its wholeness. At best, what we can do is taste it for a second. If the meal on Shabbos day was the meal of Zer Anpin. So then we would feel that full unity was a possibility. And then at the third meal, we would ascend to Atika Kadisha to the loftiest level, fully realizing unity. But because it is an impossibility for a human being to fully experience that totality, to fully experience that lofty level, we taste it in the morning only to realize at Shalashudis that it was transient and it wasn't lasting. Or in the language of Rav Menachem Mendel of Shklov in his parish on the Idrizuta, the reason we go from the highest experience of Atika Kadisha back down to Zer Anpin at the third meal is because what we tasted for but a moment wasn't the lasting reality and we descend back to our normative human experience. Again, highlighting what we've been speaking about which is that the experience of Shabbos day is so intense, it is so ever present that we can only touch it by way of a distance. Because if a human being were fully capable of experiencing that yichud of Shabbos morning, experiencing that unity of the self and the world and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, creation and history in our own psychological situatedness would no longer need to perpetuate itself we would have reached the apex. But as Rav Soloveitchik points out, it is only for but a moment. It is a taste, it is a remez. And in a psychological sense, it means acting as if we are experiencing that moment. That even though we don't truly feel like all of our work is done, we can taste a moment of ki'ilu komlachtacha asuya. That ki'ilu, which allows us to recognize that even though I am just pretending to experience this experience that is beyond my ability to experience, nevertheless, in my pretending, I touch it for but a moment. This is why Shabbos is a me'ein o'ilam haba. It is a taste of o'ilam haba, but at the same point, it is still concealed and reserved for a future point that is beyond human rationality. The experience of Shabbos day itself is l'mal l'mitam v'das. It's above our capacity to rationalize it. It is the nekuda of keser yitnu It is the nekuda of the crown, the full yichud, 
which can only be realized by way of recognizing that we can't truly touch it yet. This is the remarkable language of the Arizal in Shara Kavanos and in Priyat Chaim when he says something that I couldn't believe when I read it. That Aye Mekoim Kavoidai, like we say in Kedushas Keser, Aye Mekoim Kavoidai, that the Malachim are asking, Where is the place of your glory? Aye that nature of aye, of longing, of questioning, of ayeka, of that echa that we're moving ourselves out of, whose nechama can only come through Shabbos. That question of aye for our tzaddikim, for Rabbi Nachman, as he describes in the 12th teaching in the second volume of Lakuta Maharan, is the existential call that ascends from the depths of human experience in its brokenness. That there comes a time where a person finds themselves in a place where it is impossible to feel anything, where I no longer have access to the asa'amamaros shenivru ha'olam. I no longer have access to any residual experience of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence right now. Yet nevertheless, it is by way of that harrowing existential cry that ascends from the depths of Aye Mekoim Kavodo, that I gain access to the truest presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is the reality that even in the lowest of lows, everything is part and parcel of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the Arizal says as follows, Hine kol remez bepasuk, zachor es yoim hashabbos. Es yoim hashabbos, the day of Shabbos itself, is Roshe Tevos Aye, is the acronym of Aye, where are you HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Aye mekoim kevodo. So on the one hand, we're crying out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Aye Mekayim Kavodo. Where is it? I can't feel it. I can't truly touch it. Where are you? But at the same point, by expressing that Aye, by expressing that realization that as a human being, at best I can pretend. At best I can act as if. At best I can act as if everything is done, as if everything is okay, as if everything is complete. That is the way that I gain access to Keser. The Arizal has further remarkable drushim on that word aye, that it's the malachim asking us, how in the world did human beings reach such a lofty level of the day of Shabbos? It's impossible. It's not according to the natural order of things. Atika Kadisha shouldn't be here now. It should be at the end of Shabbos. And that's why the Arizal says we lift our legs up high. We lift our feet up high when we say Kadusha because it's a dilug. We're showing that it's spooky action at a distance. We have no rightful place here in the space of Keser, in the space of Atika Kadisha, and that experience of Koyu Malachtecha Asuya, of that world of Olam Haba. And the Malachim are saying, how in the world did they get here? Ayim Ekaim Kavoida, you're supposed to be down there still. How did you get up here? But that's the secret of Shabbos, that we jump and we leap, even though we don't truly feel it. Even though we're not truly there, we're acting as if we're there. And we're willing to say, Ke'ilu komlach tacha asuya. Rav Kuk writes in Oilis Rayan, the second volume, he says something remarkable. It's not according to the Nusach Svard. It's according to the Nusach Ashkenaz of the Siddur Hagrad that Rav Kuk davened with. I think that's correct. But Rav Kuk says, why is it that in Na'aritzcha, the Nakdishcha, why is it that at that time of Yichud on the Musaf of Shabbos, where everything is meant to be fully present in our lives, where we're meant to truly chase the unity, taste the unity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, why is it that we say, Kisoid Siach Sarfei Kodesh, like the secret language of the Malachim? Why couldn't it just be Soid Siach Sarfei Kodesh? Because Rav Kook says, it's always going to be Bechaf Hadimyon, it's always going to be still in our imagination. We're acting as if we've reached that lofty place. We're acting as if we've reached that place of menucha v'simcha. But nevertheless, even though we know it's still just the dimyo and it's still just ki'ilu, nevertheless, we're willing to abandon our rationality and throw ourselves deeply into that space of the yichud of Shabbos, which is acting as if everything is okay. This is what Rabbi Nachman HaKadosh writes in the fifth teaching, that on the day of Shabbos, we have the ability to experience that level of Olamecha Tira B'chayecha, 
to imagine in our mind's eye that I am tasting the fullness of experience right now, that everything I need is right here. And even though my rational mind knows that it's not, and even though my emotional space feels like it's not, nevertheless, I can make a hachlata sanefesh, which is a koyach in the soul that is higher than rationality or emotionality, that decision-making, the capacity to decide to feel something, which is the nekuda of bechira chavshis, our ability to choose Shabbos, in that moment, we experience oilem haba melting into oilem hazeh. And not to read it as me'ein oilem haba, as if it's a part of oilem haba, but rather to read it as ma'ayan oilem haba. It's a stream that flows from oilem haba into this world something that is completely contingent within the mind's eye, within the capacity to quite literally imagine, to create images, that re'iya, that vision that is talui in the world of chachma, that world of the re'iya sasechal, of e'nei ha'eda, the eyes of the chachme Yisrael, the willingness to abandon rationality and to act as if for a moment. And what Rabbi Nachman says there is that there's a question. There's a question on HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kav Yachol. Because Chazal have told us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Makayim all of the mitzvos. On a certain level, whatever that means in some form of anthropomorphic manifestation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that Hashem is Shomer the mitzvos. And the Arizal asks, how is HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shomer the mitzvah of paying a day worker his wages on that day? that there's a mitzvah that you have to pay somebody who's worked for you on that day. It's a positive commandment that you can't delay their payment. But on the other hand, we know that schar mitzvah Baha'i al-maleka, that there's no reward for mitzvahs in this world and that it waits for the world to come. So the Arizal says, how could it be that Hashem is not makayim the mitzvah of paying us on the day of our work? So the Arizal points out, and Rabbi Nachman points this out in Torah Hay, that biyumo titen scharo, that on that day I will repay them for their efforts is the acronym or the Roshe Tevos of Shabbos. That Shabbos itself is that experience of Hashem rewarding us in this world for our work. It's an otherworldly experience that cannot truly be experienced on a phenomenological level, but it can only be experienced by the suspension of our disbelief to act as if. This can explain certain elements of the day of Shabbos. Nowhere else do we find the mitzvah associated with going to sleep during the day. Bederech klal, except perhaps on Purim, which is going to be deeply connected according to the Shita of the Ramah. Sleep is very often seen as a suspension of the intellect. The intellect is meant to be the crowning jewel of the individual in the world. Sleep at night is a natural necessity that allows for a certain spiritual ability that was hitherto inaccessible, but it's not seen as something that is positive or of necessity. But on Shabbos, we're told that Shana b'Shabbos Tanug, that sleeping on Shabbos is Oineg. Part of the possible explanation to this, especially the way that the Tzemach Tzedek explains it and Reveli Weintraub, Schusio Ganalehem explains it as well, is that the avoid of going to sleep is entering into that place beyond Tam Vedas, above and beyond our rational awareness, entering into that space of holy imagination, into that place of halomos, into that place of dreams where we experience something in a very real way, even though we know that it's not real. But the fact that it's not real, the fact that it's just a ke'ilu, doesn't detract one iota from the power of the experience. That the experience of Shabbos day is the experience of willing to abandon our intellect and live as if everything is okay right now. To live as if in this moment, all is good. And to live with that emuna that is rooted in the space of Kesser. To end, I want to read a very powerful teaching from the Tzaddik, the Holy Rebbe, Rav Yitzhak Meyer Morgenstern Shlita. This is going to be brought down in Lekutei Am HaChochma, Erech HaDveikus, in the first volume, on page 302. It's taken from a drasha that the Rebbe gave on Shal Shudis Parshas Naso Shnas Tovshin Ayin, 10 years ago, in 2010. When it comes to the holiness of Shabbos and all other holy times, there are times where a person feels the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
And there are times where a person feels concealment. And it is incredibly important that a person not be overwhelmed or moved by the fact that there are times that they're feeling Hashem and times where they're not feeling Hashem, or times where they're feeling Shabbos and times that they're not feeling Shabbos. Because it is specifically within the situation of concealment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to himself as well. And that's also a level of dveikus. That even though we don't feel it, not feeling it is a form of feeling it. Not experiencing it is a way of experiencing it. Like the dveikus, like the connectivity of Yom HaKippur, where a person refrains from pleasure, but that refraining from pleasure is in truth the fullest expression of pleasure. And Rav Itchemeyer continues, and he says, because concealment of these feelings is a form of connection that is above the ability to feel it. It's a bechina of ta'anug she'eno murgash, an unfelt, unconscious form of pleasure. Meaning to say that that experience of Shabbos morning itself, of not feeling it, is exactly the type of ta'anug that a person is meant to feel. And when a person merits to transform that pleasure that is not felt, into a state of feeling it, at that point there's a unity. What Ravit Shemayer means, Lefianias Daiti, Lefianias Daiti completely, is that when a person recognizes that I'm not feeling it at all, I'm only pretending, and then we bring that feeling of pretending and we acknowledge that that's exactly what I need to be doing right now in that space of Atika Kadisha, which I typically don't have access to, or I never have access to, but I could pretend I have access to it. At that point, that tainug she'eno murgash, that unfelt, unconscious, inaccessible form of pleasure, begins to be felt in a real way. And we begin to be okay with the fact that we're not okay, because on the level of asika kadisha, even not being okay is okay. And that's a bechina of biyumel titen scharo. On that day, we should be rewarded. It's a me'ein o'ilam haba that is so lofty and so holy that we can't even feel it. But Ezra Sashem, what we're going to discuss next week is the third meal, is the time of Rava de Ravin, the time of the cultivation of desire for desire itself. And we're going to speak about how in the midst of the Yichud, in the midst of that annihilation of the self and that imaginative space of unity, one of the most significant things for us to remember is that this unity will not necessarily last. Because as the Taris Chacham points out, as Rav Chaim de la Rosa points out, and Rav Itchemeyer makes a big asek out of this all over the place, that on Shabbos, the tachlis of Shabbos is a giloy of Ein Sof. That the ta'anug, the pleasure of Shabbos, is a revelation of the infinite. So what happens next week? What happens afterwards? Do we lose sight of the infinite? And what the Taris Chacham explains and what Rav Itchemeyer brings out incredibly clearly is that no, we ascend from the experience of the infinite of this week, and we prepare ourselves to enter into a new experience of yearning towards a higher level of reality, towards a higher expression of the infinite that will come with the next Shabbos, because it's an infinite process. And Be'ezra Sashem, after speaking about Rava de Ravin, the cultivation of the will and the desire towards desire, will be prepared to enter into that space of Motzei Shabbos as well.